Hey, visionaries, you are now tuned in to the Starts With a Vision podcast, where everything you do in life starts with a vision. If your vision is clear or foggy, you are in the right place. It's time to go take what's yours, because there's a vision only you can see, and a dream only you can dream. And now, your host, Mr. Starts With a Vision. What's going on, everybody? It is Mr. Swab, Mr. Starts With a Vision, and we got another banger today, man. We got another episode that's going to rock your socks off. Today, we have Joseph Wilson on the line, on the interview, on the podcast today, and here's what I want to say. Joseph represents not only achievement, but excellence, okay? We had a conversation, and you guys are going to hear it, but you know what I got from him is you know, be your best at all times. And I mean that, you know, and just talking to him and kind of understanding a little more, he's very, very, very not only accomplished, but disciplined and just a person who, you know, only wants to be the best at what they do. And so I thought this interview and this conversation was very, very impactful. So Joseph Wilson is an attorney and he is the best in the business and he's continuing to grow and do so many things for the community, local and going to national as well. So listen to this episode. You're going to get a whole bunch of nuggets from it. What's going on, everybody? This is Isaiah Fowler, a.k.a. Man, you already know it's Mr. Starts With A Vision, Mr. Suave. Everything you do in your life, it starts with a vision. And you know, every single week, we work so, so, so hard to get you people on this podcast, guests on this podcast, entrepreneurs doing something different, making things look different inside of their industry, disrupting their industry. And today's guest is no less. We have Joseph Wilson on the line. He is an attorney, a trial attorney, but he's making being an attorney look cool. He's making it look fashionable. He's making it look dope. So, Joseph, how are you doing today? Hey, what's going on, man? I appreciate you having me on. No problem, man. How's your day going so far? Oh, man, it's, it's going pretty well so far. Mm-hmm. Got a bunch of calls as soon as I got in the office, so I'm trying to make it happen. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's going all right. I hear you, man. How do you how do you enjoy being an attorney? Because I know the I know the stigma is is uh, you know it, it's a little bit different. You know, it seems right. like it's always uptight and stuff like that. But how do you like being an attorney? Yeah, I actually really enjoy it. And you're right; there is a big stigma that a lot of attorneys and law firms are uptight. Mm-hmm. And actually, the first law firm that I worked for was very much like that. It was a you know, white collar law firm, defense corporate law firm. I was the only black male attorney in the entire office in Atlanta, which is crazy in itself. And so in the, for the past two, three years, I've been doing plaintiff's work where I actually represent individuals who've been injured in motor vehicle accidents, commercial motor vehicle accidents as well. And so it's a lot more laid back on the plaintiff side. Folks are a lot more relatable as far as the lawyers. And so, you know, if you see me right now, I'm in jeans and a, and a sweatshirt. So, like, this is how I come to work when I'm not in trial or in a deposition or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I know that's actually really good because, uh, I mean, me personally, I'm not the suit kind of guy. So, did you like wearing the suits right. all the time? or? I mean, not every day, man. It's just, it's just too stuffy right. to wear a suit every single day with a tie. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I do enjoy dressing up for special occasions. So, you mm-hmm. know, if we're having a nice event where I have to get fly, I like doing that. You know, if I have to go to court, mm-hmm. I have nice suits. I have tailored suits. And I think it's important that you can switch it up. Right. And you can be casual and look nice and you can dress up and look nice. So I like to switch it up. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So why? Um, what, what made you want to go the route of being an attorney? Actually, it stems from undergrad. Like my junior year, I was an accounting major uh, because my dad is an accountant. Also played ball, um, basketball in college as as well at Jacksonville State University. Mm -hmm. But as I was, you know, getting towards graduation, I realized, man, I don't want to be an accountant. I don't want to crunch numbers. That's Mm -hmm. boring. And so I was doing some research. I came across a guy by the name of Johnny Cochran. You know, we all know him as representing O.J. Simpson, all these celebrities. And mm-hmm. I started pulling YouTube clips and things like that and just seeing the way this black man commanded the courtroom, was the best trial lawyer in the whole courtroom. And he's just amazing. I was like, I want to do that. I want to be like him. And so that was kind of my 
push into wanting to become an attorney, wanting to be a trial lawyer is Johnny Cochran. He's my frat brother as well. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Which, uh, what would you pledge? Capital officer. Okay. Okay. That's what's up, man. So yes, after, sir. go ahead. What'd you say? Yeah, I said, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. After you, you, you graduated, did you have to, um, like, was your, was your time to graduate extended a little bit or? You know, uh, so I graduated law school in 2012. I entered law school in 2009. So law school is three years. Mm -hmm. And then after you graduate, you have to pass the bar in whatever state you want to practice in. I went to law school in Missouri, in St. Louis, but I wanted to practice in Georgia. So I had to take the Georgia bar. Um, bar is, the bar exam is crazy. You're studying all summer. It's a two-day-long test. It's very miserable. It's the, it was the most miserable summer of my life. <laughs> Take the two day test, and then you got to wait three months to get the results back to see whether or not you passed. And the problem with that is you start work. So I got the results in October, but you start working at your firm typically in late October, late August, or September. So meanwhile, you're at work, all the other lawyers are waiting on your results, and they're going to know if you passed or not. And again, remind you, I'm the only black male lawyer in the entire firm, so I'm nervous. I'm like, well, what if I fail? What, if they, what are they going to think of me? Mm -hmm. Are they going to judge me? Fortunately, I passed on the first try, um, and so I didn't have to deal with all of that. But it's definitely, definitely a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. leading up to that moment. Right, right. And so um, what I noticed about you, man, is you have quite a few accolades, if you will. You know, you're pretty um, distinguished in terms of um, you have a lot of achievements. How did you go about kind of standing apart from, from everybody else, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and, and getting these awards and stuff like that to stand out and to eventually, you know, I, I think this is a part of your brand, but how do you, you right. know, how do you see the world in terms of standing out and doing things different? So, I, I mean, this it's isn't cliche, I don't think, but I really, I never tried to, to to do and be like the rest of the crowd. The mm -hmm. only person I tried to emulate was Johnny Cochran, my dad, and Malcolm X to some extent, because, and I'll get into that later just as far as his, his public speaking skills. I admired that about Malcolm X and his bravery. Mm -hmm. But as far as the rest of the crowd, like I never wanted to be like anybody else. If somebody was doing something crazy over here, and it was a cool thing to do. I wasn't trying to do that. So I was always about distinguishing myself from the crowd. And so when I became a professional, when I got out of law school, that never changed. I always wanted to distinguish myself and, you know, not necessarily go after awards or accolades, but when you're doing things that are impacting your community, when you're doing things that make you stand out, you're naturally going to receive those accolades and those awards mm -hmm. and sure i mean they stroke your ego a little bit they make you feel good but mm -hmm. that shouldn't be the main reason why you're doing them you should do it because it makes a difference in someone's life and so that's really always been the motivation for me mm -hmm. and then being from atlanta mm -hmm. i just care about this city i want to make an impact on this city um and so that's just always been my motivation right right where does your pride come from um for the city of atlanta yeah, it's just, you know, uh, my dad, my whole dad's side of the family, we're all from the A. We're all, my dad was born at Grady. Mm -hmm. I was born in Northside Hospital. His mom was born at Grady. Um, and so it's just, we are Atlanta folks as mm -hmm. far as where we were born. Now, we grew up on the east side. Like, my dad went to Southwest Cab. I'm from the east side and then moved up to the north side. But, you know, this is just where we're from. And so, you know, Atlanta's changing a lot, obviously, mm -hmm. good and bad. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I take pride in being from what we call the old Atlanta. I'm sure you heard that term before, too. Mm -hmm. And so I really, I just take a lot of pride in this city. I want us to continue to fix the issues that we have and continue to grow in the areas that we are good in. So mm -hmm. it's just, I, I just love Atlanta. So. Got you. So that, that's very interesting you say that, man. And, you know, a lot of attorneys, it's like they have this, this blueprint or this roadmap that's already, you know, written out for them, you know, join a firm, that's it, or join a firm, start your own firm, that's pretty much it. But you have a lot of other right. stuff brewing, right? You have some stuff that don't even go with 
being an attorney. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's but it's happening. And that's what I really like about you. And that's what stood out to me. You know, so you said you mm-hmm. had a, a sports agency. Yes. So talk about that. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I have taken a, a bit of a non-traditional route as far as what most attorneys do, because you're right. A lot of them strictly stick with practicing law. And I think you can, you know, you hear folks sometimes saying you can only do one thing great. Mm-hmm. I completely disagree with that. Mm. I feel like you can do multiple things great if you manage your time wisely. So I'm a top-notch attorney. I'm a top-notch trial lawyer, period. Mm. But I'm also good at being a sports agent. I'm in business with a, a good friend of mine, and we represent overseas players. We do that very well. And we do it because we work together and we optimize our time wisely. I also have um, a podcast that I started um, six months ago because I felt, and it's called Mogul Mentality, I felt there was a lack of us highlighting, you know, a lot of people of color doing great things in industry. You have folks like yourself who are doing it, but there's still not enough of it. It's not, we don't see enough of it in our communities. We, mm-hmm. we only see the same things. So I wanted to start that as well. You're right. That's not something that most lawyers are doing or feel like they have the time to do and mm-hmm. make excuses and say, well, I practice, I do this, I do that. I don't have time to do it. You do. Mm-hmm. You have the time. You just don't want to make the time to do it. So right. I try to make time to do things that I think are important. Right. That's big right there, man. And, um, you know, talk talk a, a little bit more just about, like, the sports agency, you know, like, mm-hmm. are you working with people, helping them get overseas or, or from overseas and going, you know, coming here? Like, what does that whole model look like and what made you yeah. want to get into doing that? Sure. So, you know, my background is uh, I'm a former ball player. My mm-hmm. business partner is a former professional ball player. And so it was just a natural transition in that we had these relationships with guys we used to hoop with and guys who are up and coming hoopers that want to play overseas, that want to play in Israel, that want to play in Germany and Italy. And so um, I got certified as a FIBA sports agent um, last year. And so what we do is we help American players get jobs overseas. That's our job as, as sports agents to negotiate their contracts and then When they come back to the States, we want to make sure they're financially fit. So we set them up with our trusted financial advisors and accountants that can help them with their taxes as well. Um, And that's really what we do as an agency and and just trying to make sure we're putting them in the best position to be successful Mm -hmm. on the court as well as financially. Mm. That's big right there. The fact that you said... We are gonna help them with their finances as well is major mm-hmm. because what what's the biggest yes, mistake you see in the in the sports industry as a whole um, in terms oh, of man. money? Oh, they they blow money like it's like it's gonna be there forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean if you really think about it, let's say and, and the, the vast majority of overseas players they make less than a hundred grand when they're over there mm-hmm. for a year. So let's say you made eighty k. You spend 60 of it over there. And then when you're back home in the summer, you don't have a job. You know, a lot of times guys aren't working, so they're spending the rest of the money when they're back home in the States. Mm-hmm. And then they literally are, are begging. They need a job because if they don't have a job. They don't have any money. And then the life shelf of most athletes, they only play five or six years overseas. So when they come back, what real skills do they have? What money do they have? What do they, they don't have anything. And so we try to teach these guys early on, hopefully if we can get them, get guys as rookies, that, you know, you need to be investing your money early. You need to be investing the majority of your money um, in something that can build. And so that 10 years from now, when you retire, you have money mm-hmm. and you're good for a while where you can start a business. And so, you know, my, my, my business partner, while he was playing, he was already starting businesses. He was just ahead of the game with that. But the vast majority of players, they just don't think like that for some reason. So mm-hmm. we try to change that mindset. Right. What do you feel like the difference was between you and them, like you and the average ball player? Because obviously you think a lot differently than most. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I just I knew I wasn't going pro. I knew uh-huh. I wasn't good enough to go pro. Uh-huh. And the the vast majority of, of players and college guys on my team, they really thought they were going pro. Mm. I knew they weren't going pro. The coaches <laughs> knew they weren't going pro, uh-huh. but they really believed they were going to the league. Uh-huh. Had a guy on my team, really, he was a good player in college, average probably sixteen and ten, but he played the power four. He was six three, two fifteen. Mm. So I mean, he thought he was going to the NBA six three, playing <laughs> three or four, four. Right. right? So I'm like, and you can't, you can't really have an argument with him because they just really it's set in their mind. But I don't know what he's doing now. But I imagine you know it's probably a struggle because mm-hmm. he put all his eggs in that basket of, of going overseas and playing pro ball, and it didn't happen. So. Mm-hmm. You know, we just have to be realistic with ourselves. The coaches have to be realistic with the players and just tell the truth because mm-hmm. most people ain't going pro. <laughs> At the end of the day, huh? Mm-mm. Exactly. <laughs> Dang. Now, that's real right there. That's real. Were, were you, you – you said you you knew for a fact you weren't going. Um, did you get a scholarship or were you a walk-on or what? I got a scholarship. It's just I didn't play much. So, okay. um, the first year – I was there, um, I redshirted, and then we got a new coach. And so my skill set, I was a a two guard, but I was more of a a tempo athlete, not a great shooter. Mm -hmm. This new coach likes shooters. Mm -hmm. And so that was problematic because I wasn't a shooter. And so that detracted from my playing time. And then, you know, I was always just a very self-aware guy. You know, I knew I was a great athlete, mm-hmm. but I ne- I wasn't necessarily the most skilled guy in the world. And so I just I just never really aspired to be a pro athlete. I, I liked playing. I wanted to play in college. I didn't love the game like some of these other guys love the, the game and love playing the game. I wanted to be more of a professional anyway. So I was mm-hmm. a little different in that aspect anyway. Okay, yeah. And you said something. Um, You said earlier that you – feel people can do great things you know more than one thing you just manage your time even though you know we're all mm-hmm. busy what what type of ways do you manage your time and what I mean by that is do you have anything that you do like on a daily basis that helps you stay productive or it helps you stay focused or organized and continue to manage your time yeah well the, I mean the first thing I always do when I get into the office I just write down what I want to get done that day mm-hmm regardless of if related to the law or whatever, I always write, write everything down and write um, down my specific goals and topics um, that I want to get done for the day. That's the main thing. And then I just try to follow through and make sure I get all of those things done, no matter how long it takes me to get them done. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it takes me 7 p.m., 8 p.m., I'm going to try to meet my goals for that mm-hmm. day. So that's really my way. Right. It's simple as that, huh? Ain't no books, ain't no this, ain't no mm-hmm. that. Just write it down and ju- just do it. Right, exactly. Right. Do you feel exactly. like um like social media or like technology distracts you and you have to like catch yourself or are you good from that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's definitely a distraction. Uh-huh. So uh sometimes I have to just turn my phone off or put it away or put it in the car. Uh-huh. Otherwise I'll be on Instagram just like everybody else. So mm-hmm. You know, it's a it just in in this day and age, social media is definitely a, a distraction. It's just you have to take the right steps to try to negate that being a distraction. Whether, like I said, if you just have to put your phone in the car sometimes, or mm-hmm. you're just too busy and mm-hmm. need to get things done. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And how many um, episodes, like a week, do, does your podcast come out? So I, I do once once a week, so mm-hmm. it's every Monday, and so we drop. 20 episodes now it's crazy you gotten up to that many so fast but mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's once a week I try to stay ahead of the curve and um, you know rack up a few interviews at a time so I'm not always trying to constantly get guests on and find people to, to interview and that mm-hmm. frees up my time also so mm-hmm. and what type of what type of opportunities has podcasting allotted you because I know you mentioned you were like hey um, you know, stuff has come my way that I wasn't expecting. So what's come from your, you know, for, sure. for you? Sure. And you, you can probably attest to this as well. I mean, podcasting opens up a plethora of opportunities that you never really even think of. And so, you know, when I started the podcast, it was just um, more so it's just something I felt 
that could be helpful to folks. I didn't come in with the mindset, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make, try to make this amount of money or do this. But naturally, when you're doing something, again, that adds value to people's lives, people want to work with you. And so um, I've gotten speaking engagements where I'm teaching about the art of public speaking, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. Mm-hmm. And so that's brought opportunities as well because people now want me to want to work with me as a public speaking consultant. Mm-hmm. And so I'm doing that work now. And then really kind of the biggest thing that I'm working on now and that I'm dropping in January and just to kind of circle back. So the, the reason I started the podcast actually stemmed from being a part of this organization called the Emerging 100 of Atlanta, mm-hmm. which I'm the vice president for. We have all these great black men doing great things, and we mentor and work with kids on the west side of Atlanta. And so being around those guys really inspired me to start the podcast, which which inspired me to start this professional development online academy that I'm dropping in January where we're teaching specific professional development skills and we're tailoring it to millennial men of color and Mm -hmm. so it's called the mobile men empowerment academy Mm -hmm. and so it's going to be 12 modules one is going to be on the art of public speaking another is going to be on financial investment investing like the rich i'm going to bring in my expert financial advisor to teach about that and he's going to go into great detail teaching practical things to do that another is going to be on investing in real estate another will be on how to navigate the corporate environment and shoot up the corporate ladder as a minority. Mm-hmm. And then, like I said, there'll be eight other just very, you know, practical, very substantive things that we need to learn. Credit, uh, how to um, get your credit score up, how to use credit lines and things like that. Things mm-hmm. that in our community, we don't really learn about, frankly, not even in school. I mean, when I got out of law school, I didn't know about half of this stuff. Right. I just had to pick it up along the way, and it's crazy. Yeah. So. Very crazy. Yeah, just trying to add value. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, so. very crazy, because I could say the same about me. I, I didn't know about anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, that's how that's yeah. it is. And my dad was an accountant. It's not like my dad was, a you know, a blue-collar guy. Right. It's just he didn't learn it from people I mean he didn't grow up with his father it's Mm -hmm. just not something he was taught so it's not something he really taught me Mm -hmm. and it's just we're behind the eight ball right it's a cycle I wanted to absolutely it's a cycle Mm -hmm. so with with this academy we're going to be covering like I said 12 specific skills that can frankly change your life if you implement them and practice the 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 things that are going to be taught in this academy so mm-hmm. that, that was the idea behind that man that's what's up man and um i, I like i like the 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 perspective and the angle of where you come from in terms of the sports because i think sports teaches you so much about life honestly i think that sports mm-hmm. just teaches Absolutely. you about perseverance consistency teamwork all types of stuff you know so from your Absolutely. perspective what what do you think um basketball and or sports in general like the, the, the best thing that it taught you and that you kind of, you know, use and apply to this day? Oh, yeah. I mean, sports absolutely, you know, dictates the way I operate on a number of levels. I think the biggest the biggest way is how to deal with and manage other people mm-hmm. and other personalities, especially, especially when it comes to leadership skills. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when you're playing sports, you might have a guy, you might have an arrogant guy, you might have another guy who's real quiet, you might have another guy you can't talk to a certain way, you have to talk to him softer, you can't be very abrupt and blunt with. Mm-hmm. And so playing sports, you learn how to manage different guys if you're a leader. Mm-hmm. And so that's the same when you're out in the professional world. And with me dealing with different paralegals or dealing with as being vice president of the emerging, dealing with different personalities on the board for the organization, you just have to know how to push certain buttons with certain people. Mm -hmm. So I feel like what I've encountered is that a lot of guys who have not played sports, they might not necessarily know how to do that. They might not be as savvy at that. And so you'll bump heads with those type of guys a little bit more Mm -hmm. than you do with the former athletes. Mm-hmm. It's it's really kind of crazy, but yeah. and and then if you even think about it on a, a deeper level, so like let's take the the NFL. 
those I mean obviously the the league is mostly black, but they're white guys in the NFL as well. They tend to and if you talk to these type these athletes as well, these black athletes in sports, they get along a lot better mm-hmm. with the the white gentlemen who play sports in the NFL. Why? Because they're around each other, each other so much they get to learn learn about each other as well and they mesh more whereas a lot of these these billionaire owners who never played sports or who never really got to understand other types of people Mm -hmm. they just don't get it they don't empathize with them and so that's why i think sports is so important as well because you know it 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 brings it brings the races together Mm -hmm. and for lack of better words right uh, i just think sports is just important on a number of levels right and i think it's because you know everybody's on the same mission right and exactly it's, it's just to win <laughs> you, you gotta know? win exactly man yeah that's exactly. all it's about man we just wanna win so we gonna do whatever it takes so that's some mm-hmm. that's some deep stuff right there man um to, to the person to the person listening who wants to they're just working on themselves and they they want some kind of knowledge what do you think is the best thing mm-hmm. that you could tell somebody you know right here right now that would help them get to, you know, another level, a higher level from your perspective? Well, I I mean, I think the biggest thing is obviously read and find a good mentor, but also even, even more than that, you just can't be afraid to invest in yourself. Nothing great comes in life, nothing as far as information and invest. So even a book, a book is an investment. You have to put money down to get a great return. You have to read the book as well to get a great return. But a lot of times we're afraid afraid to invest in ourselves, invest in knowledge so that we can grow as human beings. So the biggest thing I would say is invest in yourself, invest in knowledge. And I think that will take you a long ways. Yeah. Why do you think people are afraid to invest in themselves, even if it's a $15 $15 book? You know, that's a that's a tough question. I mean, I think, one, you know, some folks are a little bit cheaper than others, and mm-hmm. some are just lazy. I mean, they're not willing to put in the work to learn. Mm-hmm. They're not willing to read a book, sit down and read a book, put down the Madden or the NBA 2K, mm-hmm. and actually learn. And, again, they, they, they just... Let's say, and the best, the best coaches, the best consultants, they're going to cost you. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not cheap. Their time isn't free. Right. You got to put money up to get the great value that they're willing to give you. Mm-hmm. And so we're just a lot of times just not willing to put up that type of value to get or investment to get that value. Right. And so I just think it needs to be a shift in mindset. Mm-hmm. And that again, you know, to get great value, you have to invest just like the stock market. I mean, if you put down $1 on a Microsoft stock, sure in 10 years, you'll make, you'll get a return, but it's not going to be the same as if you put 10 grand in that Microsoft stock mm-hmm. in 10 years, you're going to be worth a million dollars or worth $10 million. So that's the same thing with life and professional skills and, and working with people who have more knowledge than you and that can teach you things. Mm-hmm. That was deep right there, what you said about that $1. Mm-hmm. That was exactly, real man. deep. I'm writing that down yes, right sir. now. <laughs> <laughs> For that, just, that joint came off the top, bro. I don't man. know where it came from. I'm sure I stole it from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one right there, man. That's a highlight. Well, dang, I appreciate that a lot, man. Um, how could people no find? How could people find you and contact you? Sure. Well, my Instagram is Joseph Wilson E S Q. That's mm-hmm. Joseph Wilson W I L S O N E S Q. If you want to shoot me an email or you have some questions about the Mogul Empowerment Academy I'm talking about or my public speaking consulting um, as well, you can email me at info at josephwilson-mm.com and that's M as in mogul mm-hmm. okay so uh, info at josephwilson- dash mm.com yep okay I just want to make sure dash mm.com got it man yes, sir. well uh, I appreciate you man your time and, and giving all this information especially that one dollar with the stock so that means invest more in yourself <laughs> man don't just exactly. invest the, don't just buy the book man go go find right. the author and get their package and invest in them you know 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's deep stuff. Got to. Well, absolutely, man. Well, um, I wish you nothing but further success, man, and abundance because the things that you're doing and that you stand for is just pure achievement. And I respect that. I and I wish you nothing but, you know, good vibes and, and a whole bunch more money and success and abundance and everything else. Appreciate that, brother. Same to you, man. No problem, man. So um, with everything being said, we're going to talk to you guys on the next show. Um, that is today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Starts With a Vision podcast. Come get your vision clear at www.startswithavision.com. See you there.